Thanks for tuning in to this special edition of Google Developers Live. Today we're featuring Hadi Partovi from Code.org in celebration of Computer Science Education Week. You can find out more about Computer Science Education Week and the Hour of Code campaign at csedweek.org. Hi, my name is Mamie Reingold, and I am your host for this special edition of Google Developers Live. Our guest today is Hadi Partovi. And after getting his bachelor's and master's in computer science from Harvard, he went on to Microsoft in 1994, where he joined a small team to grow Internet Explorer. He has since advised and invested in multiple startups, including Dropbox and Facebook. And he's also founded many companies of his own, the most recent of which is Code.org. So Hadi, I'd love to start by hearing more from you about why should we all care about computer science? What is your vision with Code.org? And tell us more about this week's Hour of Code events. Sure. Well, Code.org was a realization that computers are now everywhere. They're not just on your desktop and you know on your in your laptops or at work. They're in your pockets. They're in your cars. They're in your appliances. They're they're literally all all over the place. And every industry in the world depends on software whether it's transportation, agriculture, food, and yet the vast majority of Americans have no idea how these things work, and the vast majority of schools don't even offer courses in introducing these, these things to you. And you know, a lot of people think that code.org or things like this are designed to basically produce more software engineers to get jobs at companies like Google. And you know, that's a side effect of people learning how to code. Uh, my main vision is that every student in every school should have the opportunity to learn, not because they want to get a job at Google. And computer science, you know, it is a class that you can take and get a great job. But more importantly, it's a class that you should take if you want to become a doctor in the 21st century, or if you want to become a lawyer, or a journalist, or, or even the president. Every career that you can think of in the modern day world should have some background in this. Great. And so what are, what are these Hour of Code events? The Hour of Code was a coming together of a number of ideas we had for how to promote computer science, not just to students, but to parents and to teachers, to help remove the veil that, that, of mystery that separates the average person from the Mark Zuckerbergs or the genius coders of the world, and to help everybody learn that not only this is important to learn, but that it's easy to learn, that a seven-year-old can start basic computer programming. And starting with that idea, we thought, what if we could get millions of students in schools and communities worldwide to try to learn just one hour of computer science? And how can we bring the best companies, organizations, celebrities, governments to come to bear to basically grow this into a real movement? Hmm. And so since this is about learning to code, um, when did you first learn to code? Uh, the very, very first computer program I wrote was on a programmable calculator, I think, when I was around eight years old. Uh, and my first computer I got when I was about 10 years old was a Commodore 64. And my dad gave me this computer. Uh, you know, he had, There was no games on it. I, we were living in Iran where you couldn't even buy a computer in that country. It was sort of imported from Italy. And he said, if you want to play any games on it, you have to write them yourself. And my twin brother and I immediately started finding magazines that had sort of basic programs that you could type into the computer to, to create your own game. And then starting from there, we learned how to change the games and write our own. Cool. I just took two months off to learn how to code. And like learning anything new, it, it, it can be hard. And for me, it was like learning to see and think in a whole new way. And sometimes an hour could take, it could take just an hour to understand the problem I was trying to solve. So. Tell me more about what you're envisioning kids doing in an hour of code. So, you know, as you've learned yourself from doing it, coding and writing computer programs isn't about learning a new language. And the average computer language has about 50 words in it. And I compare it a lot more to Legos. Mm. You know, when you when you use Legos, it's not like there's 10,000 different Lego blocks. There's about 50 different major blocks, but, but the art is in how you build something complicated using that limited set of commands. And the most important thing a kid can learn in one hour of, of writing code is to re realize that there's not a lot to memorize, and it's more about solving problems and creating whatever you want. And, and unleashing the creativity and empowering a kid to realize, wow, I can actually do this stuff, that's our number one goal at the end of one hour. Cool. 
Yeah, and, and so, and for those kids that know they don't want to be engineers, they don't want to grow up to be a computer science, why should they participate? At least 95% of people don't want to grow up and become a software engineer. And our goal is to get all of them to learn the basics. And the basics of computer science mean not just learning how to code, but also learning how does the internet work? What's a virus or a software virus? You know, when I went to high school, every single school and every single student taught and learned how electricity works or how to dissect a frog to see the digestive system. And in this century, schools should teach how do you effectively dissect an app to learn the insides and outs of that. And that's relevant if you want to become a doctor, healthcare is dominated now by technology. If you want to become a lawyer, understanding IP law or understanding how you're going to regulate things like the, the NSA. You know, we, we see our government stumbling with efforts in technology, and it's not because they need to become software engineers, but they need to have at least more of a basic understanding than the absolute zero that our schools currently offer. So it's like the physics or the biology of the digital world. Exactly. And yeah, essential. You, want to become a, you know, this year's Nobel Prize winners in chemistry were computer scientists. Hmm. And it's the best way of realizing this is a field that impacts everything. Mm, I love that. And since this is Google Developers Live, we have a lot of developers out there tuning in. And so what, what, can, these, what can people who are already developers, what can they do to help your mission with code.org? So most developers automatically jump to think this is awesome. You know, if you're already a developer, you already realize that you, you have a special power that most people don't <laughs> and that you can harness thousands of computers to do your bidding and you know which is a kind of an unusual thing but you know it's there, there is no other skill that helps amplify the creativity of the human mind the way computer programming does and sharing that is something that developers very naturally want to do uh, the best ways to do that are to to basically get people in your community especially your local school uh, but if not a local school an after school club like a boy scouts or girl scouts or so on to add computer science. Uh, it's harder to get schools to do this because they're, they're government organizations, but Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and Boys and Girls Clubs and so on readily can, can uh, engage in this stuff. To make it easier for developers, we've got a sign up page where engineers can sign up as volunteers to say, I want to get involved, which will then actually then help local communities who want a, a software engineer as a mentor come and pull them in. We've also released a 20-hour online course that sort of is an after, uh, you know, something that comes after the first hour of code to teach you 20 hours worth of more computer programming and also learning about things like how the internet works. And that's an online course you can teach to your kids and you know, family members, or bring to a local school or club. Cool. And also, our developer community is global, and I noticed that. Um, for the Hour of Code, it says you don't even need a computer to participate. So I want to learn more about that. How, how can people participate if they don't have access to computers or the internet? Yeah, so there's both you can do it if you don't have a computer, you could do it if you don't have the internet. We've, we've tried to solve for all versions of this stuff. If you have absolutely nothing, uh, there's paper and pen exercises where mm -hmm. somebody can write programs on a piece of paper and it's more like a sort of social exercise where one kid pretends like they're the computer managing a robotic arm doing what another kid's program is telling them to do. And then we have a bunch of puzzles like how does the robotic arm take a stack of cups and then build a Christmas tree pattern out of them? You know, and one kid needs to write the program for the other kid to execute to do that. Um, now, in a lot of the modern world, people have computers, but they don't have great internet connectivity or they don't have lots of computers, but our, our tutorials, work, we have tutorials that work on an offline computer or on a smartphone or a tablet. Smartphones are pretty popular these days and you can learn to code on one and that, that's a great way to start. Yeah, it's actually, when I've, as I've been learning to code, like writing things out and whiteboarding has been actually like the first step for anything, just to understand what is it that we're trying to do and map out how to, how to write code to do that. So I like that. Yeah, it's all about problem solving. It, yeah. it forces you to organize your thoughts better than most other things you learn. And, and it's interesting that the ability to organize your thoughts and to break a big problem down into smaller problems is really useful even if you want to become a lawyer yeah. or, or, or manager. You know, 
learning how to break down a problem is really valuable for learning how to build a team and manage who does what. Uh, they're very related skills. Yeah, applies to everything. It's like essential life skill. And so yeah. what happens if, if 10 million kids all learn to code? What, is that, what does that future look like to you? Um, first of all, hopefully our servers will hold up. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, we, we, we don't know how many people are going to hit our site uh, for the hour of code, but it's, uh, it's a little frightening. Um, <laughs> but if 10 million kids learn at least the basics of computer science, I think a number of things will happen. First of all, we'll hit an inflection point of effectively whether the school system wants it or not, the world audience is going to start learning coding and computer science at a larger scale than they have been. You know, a large percentage of the population has some familiarity with this stuff. I think you're going to see fewer, I guess, well, you'll see more innovation in every field software can create innovation. We just heard about Amazon using drones to deliver packages. You know, we hear about nanobots being used in your bloodstream to, to cure illnesses by having a little, you know, robotic thing in your blood doing stuff to you. The hardest challenges in most of these things are actually in the software and in the code. You know, building a drone is easy. Programming that drone so it doesn't run into a tree, that's actually where it's hard, or, or how it communicates with other drones so they don't hit each other. So whether you think about transportation, communication, medicine, agriculture, food, all over in, in every industry, it's the software that actually is, is driving the innovation. And so after, after this week, then what? Where do you want to see Code.org go from here? So Code.org is a surprisingly small organization. Uh, we have about, I think, 16 full-time employees. Uh, but we have a lot of ambition and a lot of big ideas. Uh, there's at least four different things we're going to be doing after the hour of code. Uh, one, we have curriculum at the elementary school level that we built uh, in partnership with Google and Microsoft and Facebook and Twitter employees. Uh, but we want to extend that to have to curriculum tools that go all the way from kindergarten through 12th grade. That's point one. Point two is actually getting this into public schools. By, by fall of next year, we should have uh, basically put computer science into about 400 schools. But we want to get to 4,000 schools and 40,000 schools. So that's a multi-year yeah. effort of bringing computer science into schools. Uh, and then the third thing we're working on is changing policies. Uh, in 36 states in the country, computer science doesn't count towards high school graduation requirements in math or science. And that's actually a great way developers can help petition their school board saying, why don't you fix the graduation rules so computer science is treated as a math or science. And so we're lobbying. And, and then lastly, we're going to continue to do marketing to help get underrepresented groups to engage in computer science more, especially girls and minorities. Cool. These are big, big problems you are trying to solve. What are, yes. have there been any obstacles along the way? I mean, education policy, those are big, big systems you are changing. Yeah, it's funny. On the policy side, things, you know, anytime you want to try to change a system, you expect obstacles. I've never worked on anything where there have, have, there's been such a sort of engagement of people embracing what we're doing and getting behind it. At the policy mm -hmm. level, we've changed on the order of six states in six months, which is Whoa, unheard of. That's fast. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's really, really fast because there's, the opposition is non-existent. Nobody says, oh, no, we shouldn't be doing this. The hardest opposition, though, we have is in changing the public schools to offer a new class. Mm -hmm. And because their mindset is literally, if we add this, what are we going to need to cut? And I've, ha I've had conversations with the district's heads of curriculum where they say, you know, I guess this is an elective, so we need to probably cut another elective. What if we cut ceramics? What are those kids who want to do ceramics going to do? And, you know, I have, I'm just overwhelmed just thinking, well, first of all, they can learn ceramics in an after-school class. Let's teach computer science in the real school. Uh, there's no jobs in ceramics. There's a million jobs in computer science over the next 10 years. And then lastly, why don't we let, let the kids decide, you know, why is the school deciding that isn't available but ceramics is? You know, if, if you have to make a choice, choose the one that is going to be more popular, let the kids decide rather than you deciding. But either way, that's by far our hardest obstacle is finding school districts who are willing to create change. Hmm. And so what are, 
just to recap, what are the things that folks can do after they watch this, if they're inspired to help you and your mission? How can they help? How people can help, uh, the easiest way is sign the petition at code.org. Uh, the next easiest way is do an hour of code yourself, or if you know it already, do it with a, a brother, a sister, a daughter, a son, or your mother. Uh, harder ways, you know, you can spend some money and buy one of our t-shirts to help promote uh, code, especially if you're a girl. Uh, and, and the best way you can help if you're an engineer is get your local school to teach computer science on our website to help you do that, to help you advocate for that. That's great, Hadi. Thank you for joining us. And thank you all for tuning in. Make sure to join in on the fun at code.org during Computer Science Education Week.